group of individuals. On average, somebody looking at an X-ray has got 15 years of experience and six years of training. You've got a three-generation body of knowledge. You give them a batch of X-rays and you say, look for anomalies. On the final X-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of an average cancer nodule, and 83% don't see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. And the scary thing is the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the others. <laughs> now, this is actually called inattentional blindness. We do not see what we do not expect to see. And this is actually probably the most important slide I'm going to show you today. Because it basically invalidates any approach based on cases. Or any approach based on individual expertise or observation. Because if something novel is happening, you literally won't see it. Or only a small number of people will. Just to give you the raw facts behind this, the most you scan of what is in front of you at any one time is about 5%. That's if you really focus. Of all the data stimulation available to you, you scan 5%. If you're Chinese, it goes up to 10%. There's actually been a different cognitive evolutionary path based on symbolic against non-symbolic language, uh, context object focus difference. But for everybody in this room, 5% at the most, 3% most of the time. And then you match it against patterns. Stored in your brain, your body, and your tools. And your social connections, it's actually distributed. And you do a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match. So if a radiologist hasn't seen something for 10 or 15 years, they're unlikely to spot it. So what we actually do is a partial data scan, and we privilege our most recent experiences. Now, in evolutionary terms, you can see why this happens. If you think about the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa, something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Do you want to autistically scan all available data, look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and having identified lion, look up best practice case studies on how to avoid lions? <laughs> you know, by that time, the only document for any use to you will be the book of Jonah from the Old Testament, which is the only example I've found of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore written by a claimed survivor. Right? <laughs> We evolved to make decisions very, very quickly based on a partial data scan privilege on our most recent experience. And if anybody tells you their professional or academic training means they don't do that, then they're probably forming an opinion even faster than you are. <laughs> it's actually why people who are naive and untrained often see things that people who are highly trained don't see, because they haven't got that sort of pattern entrainment. Now, I'm not using this to argue about expertise or argue against experience, it's just we need to get real. One of the things we need to do is to find the 17% before they talk to the 83%. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the things I'm going to come to at the end. Oh, and by the way, we're doing a huge amount of work on safety at the moment. This is one of the main reasons why you get safety problems. Because everybody builds rules and regulations based on the last, success, last failures. And the problem is the last failure never happens again, something novel happens. We've just, just completed a massive project in the northeast of England working with police firearms officers, ambulance drivers, and fire officers. And we discovered the main cause of mental breakdown is not the job, it's the health and safety rules. Because the health and safety rules are effectively written to stop the organisation getting prosecuted. Or more precisely, they're based on an average experience over the last five years. And the reality of what people encounter is different. To provide empathetic care to patients, nurses have to break the safety rules on a day-to-day -day basis. Otherwise, they couldn't do it. And this is the harsh reality of a world in which we've created too many checklists and too many regulations based on the assumption that the past will actually repeat in the future, when frequently it doesn't. Now, so I want to start with that because that's reality and we have to learn to deal with it. So complexity, at its simplest level, uh, and this is probably the most difficult thing for people to grasp. We've known about complex adaptive systems really since the 40s or 50s. Um, but in terms of social and management systems, only really for about the past two or three decades at most. Complex adaptive systems, and I'll make the statement now and expand it, are dispositional, not causal. 
There is no linear relationship between cause and effect. So you can't do root cause analysis. You can't draw causal chains. You can't even do feedback loops. Because there are so many things interacting with so many other things that the same thing never happens again the same way twice. Yeah, so we actually have three types of system. Um, ordered systems, complex systems, and chaotic systems. And just to be clear, the language of this, we don't yet have consensus across different disciplines. So mathematicians will use chaos differently from the way I use it and so on. So we just need to live with that. So I'll use, I'll use my definitions and you can go from there. An ordered system is one which has such a high level of constraint that everything is predictable. Yeah, so everything is tightly linked or tightly coupled. Yeah? Because it's tightly linked, because it's tightly coupled, because all the constraints are known, I've got a predictable system. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's extremely valuable. Human beings are very good at doing this. My favourite example is an operating theatre. Has anybody been into an operating theatre? Okay, I've been in horizontally once and vertically twice. Right? I almost got divorced on the two vertical occasions. Uh, both my children were caesarean sections. And the trouble is I grew up in a veterinary household with animals being dissected on the table over breakfast. So I regarded a caesarean section as an interesting operation and was more curious about the operation than provided the empathetic care uh, to our wife, which I was meant to do. And I made the mistake two years later of repeating the error. Right? Kind of, Dad used to be able to improve the scar the second time round. Do you think you can? And that was the wrong thing to say at the wrong time. Right? Either way... When you screw up to go into an operating theatre, yeah, what is fascinating is the scrubbing up is not just a hygiene issue, it's also a cognitive activation pattern. It aligns the identity of the individual with a role for a limited period of time. The same happens in the army when people put on a uniform. Yeah, what the ritual does is it actually creates a cognitive alignment so the person is now a surgeon. You see the same thing with pilots in aircraft. The checklist they go through has a safety function, but it's also getting them away from being who they are to the role they now have to occupy. And that's called cognitive activation. Yeah. By the way, that's really important in safety. We've done a whole range of projects now by which changing people's clothes before they change their tasks can radically improve safety, whereas rules and regulations don't. Yeah, getting lorry drivers, for example, to strap on heated belts and associated strapping on the heating belt with lifting means that you can transfer from being a lorry driver to a loader in 30 seconds as opposed to the 15 minutes it takes if you don't have a ritual. Yeah, so hold that one because we can go into that later if you want. But ritual is really important to changing the way humans be and see it because now you see things through a different set of filters. So the filters through which you want to perceive data when you're loading a lorry are different from the filters you want to perceive data when you're driving a lorry, yeah, in terms of the past patterns you use. But of course, the operating theatre is effective. We have checklists now. They count the number of surgical instruments left at an end of an operation and check it's the same as was there at the start. Uh, I regard this as I grow older of increasing importance, all right? I know the figures on how many people had to have a second operation because scalpels were left in their stomach after an operation and it's scarily high. And then people get obsessed with checklists. And they forget the checklist works because the specific context of an operating theatre is a crew. That's the technical name for these ritualised groups. It's not an ordinary team. And you can't replicate that context without that practice. And of course it's very expensive to get there. You know, to get to an operating theatre, you've got years of training, generations of practice. Yeah, it's all come together. So I remember we were working with um, BC Hydro, this is in British Columbia, on safety. They just had six critical deaths, having had none for years. And we found, actually, one of the reasons for it is they used to actually gather together on the back of a truck before they be repaired a power line. And this is a hazardous environment, by the way. For five months of the year, they're in danger of being eaten by bears. And for five months of the year, it's so cold, if you don't wear a mask, you die if you breathe in raw oxygen. So it's kind of like a, a hazardous environment anyway. And they gather on the back of the truck and they chat through the job. They're mentally rehearsing the job before they do it. Cognitive alignment. Then some idiot of a safety consultant came along and decided that natural process wasn't explicit enough, so they created a checklist. 
What now happens is the foreman looks at the checklist, says, we've done this, haven't we, lads? Tick, 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 tick. Signs it. There's no mental rehearsal. Yeah, and actually that was one of the main reasons for the critical deaths going up. Yeah, it's a failure to realise the context in which one practice works. And for the last 20 or 30 years, since systems thinking came in in the 80s, we've assumed that process is context-free, when actually in human systems, most things are context-specific. Yeah, something which works in one context won't work in another. So order is actually quite hazardous. Yeah? It's very useful when you can get it, but the cost is high. Chaos I'll come to later, but that's, in my language, a system without constraint. Nothing is connected with anything else. So if it happens accidentally, it's a disaster. If you can deliberately create it, you can do a lot with it. I'll talk at the end of this about the work we're doing on distributed decision support and discovery, uh, which basically relies on no agent being connected with any other agent when they assess a situation. Yeah, because then you can do an awful lot statistically with what you've got. And then we get complex adaptive systems, and I say, in a complex adaptive system, there are very few external constraints, and everything is somehow or other connected with everything else. But some of the connections are known, some are unknown, some are what we call dark constraints, reference to dark energy and cosmology. We can see the impact of something, but we can't see what's creating it. So these systems, and this is a key point, are inherently unknowable. If I get enough data, I can make statements about probabilities, but I can never make causal statements. Right? Now, once you realize that, life becomes a lot easier because you don't use an inauthentic technique. Yeah? So from that, we'll get... Yeah, the only thing I can say for certain, by the way, about a complex adaptive system... Anybody recognize that? Any Australians here present? Right, that's a cane toad. The only thing we know about complex systems is the only guaranteed outcome of an intervention is an unintended consequence. Yeah, whatever you do, something will happen which you didn't intend, which comes as a surprise. Now, by the way, in ethics now, this is a big issue in government. If government intervenes, then they're actually ethically responsible for what happens, even if they didn't intend it. Because if it's complex, you know there will be something you didn't expect. And that actually changes the dynamic. You do smaller things faster so you can recover quickly. The bigger the intervention in a complex system, the more dangerous it is. And by the way, the classic thing on this is a change initiative. Anybody been through a change initiative in their career? Yeah, the, the, the most worst thing you can ever do these days if you want to change a culture is to announce a change initiative. Because everybody's past history, the patterns which get activated are patterns of, oh my God, another set of promises, nothing will really change, and that's how people filter the data. Yeah, in a complex system, you start journeys, you don't achieve goals. And just to give you a statement on this, and this is all the available scientific evidence without exception, you can have the references to new scientists if you want, where people are working for explicit goals, it destroys intrinsic motivation. Where people are working for explicit goals, it destroys intrinsic motivation. I just start to think through the implications of that for the way we manage things like health, like education, like social services, where we most need empathetic care is where we have the highest level of outcome-based targets. And as I say, our work now is actually showing that it's the health and safety regulations which often cause breaches rather than the job itself. One of the reasons is the health and safety regulations are so strict that nobody can get the job done without breaking them. As a result of which, breaking the rules becomes habitual. And when breaking the rules becomes habitual, you have accidents. Yeah, so to give a personal example on this, many years ago, uh, my daughter is now approaching 30 and writing critical essays about her father's failure to understand Deleuze's theory of um, something or other, right? This is worrying when your daughters do this, all right? Um, but at the time, I could actually hold her in one arm, right? So she's like two or three years old. And I carried her up to the top of Conwy Castle in North Wales. Now, I've got her on a harness because she almost ran off the Irish ferry the previous week. You know what you know, that age is like? So I've got her on a harness, and when her mother isn't looking, I've got one of those extendable dog leads that I attach to it, all right? Which seems to me eminently practical, and I recommend it. But for some reason, it doesn't receive maternal approval. 
So we climb up to the top of the castle and we're now in, we're now in a father-daughter mood, all right? You know, it's his father-daughter against mother and son, which is a classic thing. So I hold her on the harness and we lean right over the top of the tower and we wave to people who were scared of heights and wouldn't come up, yeah? And this is a bit wicked, but then she drops her toy rabbit. I hadn't realised she had it in her arms. So this is one of those fluffy toy rabbits. It drops down about 20, 30 metres and lands on a ledge. Yeah. Now, this is the rabbit without which we cannot sleep at night. You know those rabbits? <laughs> this justifies any amount of rule-breaking by a father who will be blamed for this, not just for the next month or so, but for the rest of his life. I know my family on my deathbed, all right? They will remind me of the story of the day I lost Lisa, all right? I will not be able to avoid it. Right? So I was then a climber, that was my hobby. From a climber's point of view, a castle wall is nothing. It's vertical, it's got handholds. So I tied her to the flagpole with the dog lead. <laughs> Went over the castle wall, climbed down 20 metres, collected, you know, collected the rabbit, climbed back up 20 metres, and tied her. I got a lovely hug and a kiss for doing this, right? It was worth every minute of threat, right? Got down to the bottom of the castle to be met by the entire Conway police force who finally had a crime, all right? They're not used to crimes. And was escorted to the police station. Um, fortunately, they were fathers too, so after about 10 or 15 minutes, you know, tea and biscuits arrived and Eleanor got deeply spoiled, all right? Now, when I went over the castle wall, I suddenly discovered myself, after about five minutes, repeating something I hadn't said since I learned to climb on the Idwell slab some 20 years earlier. Three points of contact, three points of contact, three points of contact. It's drummed into you when you learn to climb. Do not move one limb till the other three are secure. Now, as you become more experienced, you're often dangling by two fingers, right? But when you start, it's three points of contact. Now, I was never safer because I knew I was breaking the rules. Breaking the rules was exceptional. Yeah, I actually got a heuristic to govern my behavior, and I'm actually going to be okay. And by the way, that's how the military work. If the battlefield plan breaks down, capture the high ground, stay in touch, keep moving. So what we now do in complex situations is we have rules about who can break the rules and when, and then we have heuristics that manage the threat on the other side of the barrier. And the key thing is that rule breaking has to be so exceptional that people are paying attention when they break the rules. Because if you force an excessive level of constraint into the system, People have to break the rules to get the job done. Rule breaking becomes habitual. That's when you have bad accidents. And the thing to remember is most systems thinking was based on an engineering metaphor and specifically on a computer engineering metaphor. And the problem is anything a computer is good at, a human being is bad at and vice versa. Most process re-engineering approaches are basically assumed that human beings will make decisions the way a computer makes decisions and that's not the way it works in practice. So complexity is very different. Now, I'm not going to draw the Canavian framework for you because that's around in there, but it basically distinguishes um, basically order into areas where the relationship between cause and effect is obvious and areas where it's highly complicated. But it basically says whichever domain you're in, you work differently. Now, that actually is a revolutionary concept. For the last 20 or 30 years, the assumption is each management method is universal. Now, I've lived through process re-engineering, I've lived through total quality management, I've lived through knowledge management, through blue ocean strategy. we now got design thinking coming through. Uh, the way you know something has reached the end of its life cycle is when IBM adopted a strategic, and there are online training courses you can buy for a few hundred dollars, all right? That's the time to move on, right? Um, as a lesson on that. Um, if anybody's interested in that, by the way, we're actually finishing off the completion of a complexity-based approach to design thinking um, in Wales this October. That's been a whole year project uh, based on distributed ethnography and distributed ideation. Yeah. Either way, what the basic principle of Kinevin is says there's nothing wrong with rigid engineering approaches if you've got an ordered system. There's everything wrong with them if you've got a complex system. If you've got a complex system, you do parallel experimental probes to see what's possible before you commit resources. Yeah? As you stabilize things and you get repeating relationships between cause and effect, you've made it ordered, you can now engineer it. Yeah? And the issue is, it's a British phrase on this, horses for courses. 
If you're going to bet on a racing horse, you check the ground conditions first. Yeah, some horses run well on, good, on dry ground, some on wet ground. The context determines the methodology that you adopt. And if I can get one message across today, is there is no universal method. Process re-engineering and Six Sigma, which came afterwards, or as some of us call it, Six Stigma, business process re-engineering with the worst aspects of American fundamentalism added onto it for good measure. It has high priests who wear black belts, right? And if they get a black belt, they're exempt from doing any real work because their job is to impose cult discipline on those people who do, right? <laughs> if you don't know the story, 3M abandoned it completely in all by core manufacturing it because it was destroying their capacity to innovate. Nothing wrong with it in manufacturing, everything wrong with it in R&D. Everything wrong with it in marketing, yeah? Different methods and different tools work in different contexts. You have to work out, to use a philosophy, the ontological assumptions behind the method before you determine the tool. Yet what assumptions of causality sit within the method? Most systems thinking actually assumes causality, right? That's really good for order, or the boundaries that are zones with complexity, but it won't work in complexity because a complex system is dispositional, not causal, so we need different techniques. So that's what I want to kind of like move on to. And I want to really do that by introducing some base statistics first. Yeah. Um, now you've all seen risk assessment frameworks uh, which are based on a normal distribution. Everybody remember normal distributions or the bell curve? All God's children love bell curves, all right? We love bell curves, yeah? If we can set something to a bell curve, everything is fine because we can basically say everything down here is a highly unlikely event, so we don't have to worry about it. If we cover off everything here, we've done a good job. Yeah? And you can see this in a whole body of risk and other models. Now, the problem is, if I do a double log scale of size against frequency, um, this is actually based on the work of Didier over at the University of Zurich, who's a geophysicist. Uh, geologists know more about uncertainty than most engineers because they have to predict earthquakes. Yeah? So basically, if you look at earthquake modeling and you do a double log scale of size against frequency, you get a pattern which looks like this. And I can draw a straight line through it. It's not straight here for reasons I'll come back to. And that's called a power law. And that's actually a type of Pareto distribution. A bell curve is a type of Gaussian distribution. If I draw one over the other, the model looks like this. All of a sudden, the number of things in the center of the distribution are far less, and the tails are massive. And the problem, if that's the case, you can't avoid failure. And this is a scary thing. One of the big problems we've got in health at the moment is people are trying to build systems which don't fail. And if you try and build a system which doesn't fail, people won't report failure, so the system, when it fails, fails catastrophically. In a single morbidity disease, you can actually prevent failure. But most people in hospitals are multimorbidity. The problem is complex. So what matters now is early detection, fast recovery, not prevention. Now, that's a really important for safety and everything else. Early detection of micro failure allows you to recover quickly. If you try and disguise failure, when the failure comes, it's massive. Yeah? Now, if we look at that, in the center of the thing, everything is fairly similar. That's this bit here. Down here, I can assess what is probable. So there I've got a, effectively a symmetrical relationship between the past and the future. Nothing is going to happen in the future which is anything other than a minor variation of the past. So that's when causal changes work, process engineering works, it's all cool. Nothing wrong with that, tick in the box, go do it. It's probably about 80% of what you do. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. As I come here, life gets more interesting. This is where actually I have to assess anything which is possible. And the domain of things which are possible is much higher than probable because I'm now getting asymmetry between past and future. So there is some repetition between past and future, but there's increasing novelty or massive variation in the future. I don't get exact repetition. And this is where we do scenario planning, you know, contingency planning, cone of possibilities, all those sort of things. It costs us more money, but we're dealing with a level of uncertainty. Again, nothing wrong with that. 
But up to that point, I can make statements about the future based on the past, so I can use hypothesis-based methods. As I move over here, I now have to deal with anything which is plausible. And possible, possible, plausible goes like that. It's exponential in numbers. I've now got massive asymmetry between the past and the future. There's very little repetition. In fact, if I use the past to make statements about the future, I'll inevitably miss weak signals because what is happening isn't what happened before. Remember the gorilla in, the, in radiology? That's the principle. Something novel is happening, you won't see it. Yeah. So at this point, we need different research techniques. And this is where we get what's into what we work on, which is called abductive research. Abduction, you have deduction, induction, abduction. Deduction, if A, then B. Induction, all the cases of A have B. Abduction is sometimes known as the logic of hunches. What's the most plausible connection between apparently unconnected things? Now, the good news is human beings are really good at this. It's actually what makes us so adaptive. I mean, I've lost count of the number of things I've repurposed late at night in hotel rooms to open beer bottles. <laughs> Yet we're enormously creative in seeing unexpected connections. It also makes us very prone to conspiracy theory, by the way. It's actually, it, it, there's an upside or downside. And if you want to know, the reason we're good at this is cave painting comes before language in human evolution. It's an accident, but it's the ability to go up to a high level of abstraction which allows us to create novel ideas. So one of the disasters in modern education is to focus on STEM education. Because actually, if you want innovation, you need people to understand art and poetry and music because that's historically how the human race has innovated by going up a level of abstraction. Yeah? Um, but that's a lecture for another day. So basically, this stuff is key. And I just have to do because it's vital to the way we work. So I can't go into the detail, but let's actually show you a map. So this is actually working on safety within a large engineering company. What we've done here is we've got engineers to observe micro-anomalies on a continuous basis throughout the day in return for which they don't have to write an end-of-shift report. We started this with the US Army in Afghanistan. You don't have to write a patrol report if you have continuous field observation. And by the way, this is really important. Field observation gives you real-time data rather than retrospective memories at the end of the day. Now, we'd be doing this a lot with water companies, allowing them to take pictures of a pump if they suspect there's something wrong, but it's not serious enough to report it, and literally index it. One of the ways we do it is we have a triangle which says it smells wrong, it tastes wrong, it feels wrong. So it's ambiguous capture, ambiguous interpretation. We've increased weak signal reporting by a factor of over 25, and because we got massive weak signal reporting, we can detect water leakage early. Because we're getting those early signs before things are visible. So it's that sort of an approach. The left one here is civilian manufacture. The right is military manufacture. The vertical dimension is rule compliance. The horizontal dimension is job completion. Now, you can immediately see the problem in civilian manufacture. You either get the job done or you follow the rules. Now, when I presented this to the board, nobody challenged me. All of their focus groups, all of their expert interviews, all of their questionnaires said they were doing both because everybody knew that's what they were meant to do. But the day-to-day -day observations of their engineers showed a completely different picture. And you can't challenge that, right, because it's ungameable. The right looks better because you've got that group at the top right who are following the rules and getting the job done. But when we look at the underlying data, it turns out to be nuclear weapons testing, which creates an existential quality to rule compliance and job completion that you don't get in other contexts. Yeah? You've then got the bottom right pattern, we'll get the job done and ignore the rules, and you've got this one here, we're giving up, we're doing what we need to do. We're seeing that model in hospitals, by the way. In a crisis, everybody is brilliant. On a day-to-day -day basis, people break the rules, but increasingly, people are giving up and just surviving. Now, if I want to change this system, I have to look that too far away. 
a classic safety program or change program, we try and get everybody to the idealistic state. And that won't work. It's just too big a leap. What I do is identify here the adjacent possible, one of the best named terms in complexity, and I say, what can I do tomorrow to create more like these and fewer like those? Now, that's a whole new theory of change, because I'm looking at real observations by real engineers and saying, how can I get more of these and fewer of those? I'm not talking about abstract qualities. I'm talking about deep pragmatism. And this, by the way, is called a vector measure. I'm measuring direction and speed of travel from the present rather than defining outcome. And if you have vector measures, you're more likely to discover novelty than if you have outcome-based targets because outcome-based targets filter you down to achieving the target rather than discovering process. So if I look at that, I can then actually provide for each factory their own framework, all from the same source data. So instead of a one-size-fits-all program across the whole company, everybody at their own level of competence to make a difference is saying, what can we do tomorrow to create more like these, fewer like those? And that's how we're now running safety. Yeah, giving people constant feedback from real-time observations, more like this, fewer like that. It's also a major source of innovation. So final kind of couple to make the point. Remember I said, how do you identify the 17%? Okay, a lot of our work at the moment is measuring attitudes, because attitudes are lead indicators, compliance is a lag indicator. If I can intervene with an attitudinal shift, it doesn't cost me much money and it's not pejorative. If I get a compliance breach, any intervention is really political. So what we're doing is presenting infographics, showing multi because people these days can't read a paper anymore, they require multiple bits of news items, a video, a news item, you know the way it works? So we present an infographic over two or three scrolling screens. Every engineer looks at that infographic, and the infographic basically has lots of examples of where people broke the rules to get the job done, and it was the right thing to do, as well as cases where people broke the rules and it was the wrong thing to do. So it's deliberately ambiguous. People then interpret that. They tell a story of why it couldn't happen here and a scenario about what it would do in the future. And from that input, we can now mine for complacency. We got scenario planning about what we would do if we had the disaster. But then critically, we got these things. These are dispositional maps which show how actually people are seeing the same problem, seeing the thing differently. Everybody's seen the same data, and you can see here you've got three radically different groups. Now, this is, by the way, how we found the 17%. You create an infographic about an abstract problem, a deeply, pro you know, an intractable problem. You present it to everybody for interpretation. You look at the fitness landscapes, and you found the outlier clusters because those are the people you talk to. And this is actually using chaos theory in our sense, because now everybody is making a decision independently of everybody else. And the final thing, which is sort of controversial, is basically, how many people have got children? Okay, do you tell your children stories about how Janet and John stayed at home, did what mummy and daddy said, and achieved the family KPIs? Anybody do that sort of story? <laughs> Or just to scare you, there are now American consultancies who actually set up KPIs and change programs for families. All right? I'm not allowed to mention evolutionary theory with the Ebola management teams in Dallas because it's controversial. Right? This is scary when you think about it. But the stories we tell our children, that Janet and John went into the woods and met the wicked wolf and the witch, and it's all really scary. Yeah? And we make sure we have a happy ending because we do want them to sleep at night. But all fairy stories tell stories of failure. The stories which spread around factories aren't stories about I clipped my safety belt on so I didn't fall off the gantry. They're I didn't clip on, I fell off the gantry, I fell on one of my mates, he broke his leg but I didn't break my back. Everybody will tell that story. That's a real case. We learn through stories of failure, not stories of success. Yet we evolved as malicious gossips. Because avoidance of failure is a more successful evolutionary strategy under, under conditions of uncertainty than imitation of success. So if you want to actually improve behavior, you create worse practice systems 
not best practice systems, and people will take part. <laughs> what I've tried to say is not to challenge everything we've done for the past 30 or 40 years in terms of its applicability, but to challenge its universality. You know, I did a lot of work with Peter Drucker before he died. One of the things we agreed is that, cis that complexity thinking and scientific management had a lot in common because they both recognised the role of human judgement. What systems thinking has tried to do in its popular forms is eliminate human judgement. Yeah? And that's kind of like where we need to go back to. It's horses for courses, it's understand the context, use different methods and tools in different contexts. Thank you very much for your time. Who would like to ask a question? Anyone? I told you they wouldn't. No? I have a question. Yeah. At the back. If no one asks, I ask. Isn't that called signal to noise when those 70% just see it and the others avoid the gorilla? No, it's actually, it's actually a cognitive filtering. It's, it's cognitive filtering. Li literally, it's what, 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 what parts of your brain and body are activated. Yeah? So even if, I mean, what's interesting is their eyes actually scan the gorilla. We know they took the data in, but they don't pay attention to it. Yes, I meant the deliverable, not the mm. process. So, so I, I watched that models of our aircraft we built, and they're turboprops, so they're scoot a bit, 12 degrees. Yeah. And my, I saw them, and, and then I saw a background photograph, and I said, oh, this is wrong, this is skewed. He said, no, that's, that's perfectly real. And my mind had corrected this. But yeah. this was okay for me, because it was a model, I, I don't want to think about it. So, so, I mean, if you're looking for cancer, you want those guys to focus on these bad spots, right? Now, they weren't told to look for cancer, they were told to look for anomalies. Ah, oh, my English, sorry. Uh, they were told to look for anomalies, that's actually really important, all right? But they assumed, yeah, and that's a big issue, right? So, the longer people stay in a certain position, seeing things from a certain perspective, then that filtering applies. I'll give you another example. We've been working with Roma kids in, in Hungary to gather stories from Roma populations. When we present that data to the anthropologists in Vienna and ask them to interpret it the way the Roma children interpreted it, there's actually zero correspondence between the two. And the Roma children have more possibilities for intervention because they're describing something they know, whereas the anthropologists have all read the same papers, so they have a narrow field. The scary thing is the anthropologists, when we told them this, said, ah, they don't understand their own stories. <laughs> but that's the expert reaction, right? So the danger with expertise is it's brilliant when you've got an ordered system, but it can be disastrous when the system has slipped into complexity. Thank you very much, Dave. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Seb? Seb around? Because his computer's gone off. Can anyone see where Seb is? If anyone can grab him, that's great. Because I don't know his password. Um, while waiting for Seb to come back to uh, power on his uh, laptop. Um, <laughs> it went off, sorry. I know, IT security. Um, why don't you trust me? after all these years. Um, <laughs> um, Joe's, Joe Cassa presented last year, so I assume most of you already know him for that reason. Um, I mean, incredible credit to the guy. Um, he's flown from Australia <laughs> to be here, just for this event, um, with a broken elbow, which sounds like I mean, one of the most painful things that you can break. Um, and, uh, and he didn't cancel his trip with that. I mean, incredible credit to him. Um, and as well, he's staying around um, for a couple of weeks and has actually also offered to do for completely free um, a couple of workshops 
for the SSE, well, workshop stroke presentations on systems thinking. We're going to try and run one uh, possibly this week uh, on Thursday. We're just waiting for the venue to be confirmed. And we've definitely got one next week on Tuesday, uh, which will be run out of Siemens. Um, and in the evenings, they'll come up on our events platform, Odoo, which you're now all controlled by. Um, and, uh, and so again, I mean, incredible generosity as well from Joe to uh, offer his time to us uh, um, for, the, uh, for the organization. So um, thank you very much. Mike, thanks. Mike thinks I'm offering my time for free. Actually, I'm not. I'm marketing my book, but don't tell him. <laughs> well, thank you very much for staying. When Mike introduced Dave right before, he said one way to keep you here was to make Dave the last speaker. So I guess that means Dave is putting on another talk after I've finished. <laughs> so what I'd like to talk about are the top three tools for systems thinkers. So the context is problem solving, complex systems, and I'm going to talk about the systems and non-systems approaches, a little bit about introducing systems thinking, and the top three tools and how to use them. So today, you've had a lot of food for thought, a lot of discussion about future of systems engineering, some of the domains of systems engineering, and a little bit about the philosophy of systems engineering. What I'm going to give you are some practical tools that you can take away and use tomorrow, next week, and in the future. So you've all learned about the problem solving process, right? Somebody gives you a problem and you come up with a solution. Yes? But do you realize that's incorrect? Well, that's, we treat it as a linear process, but it's not because somebody has to define the problem. And as you, become, as you move up in higher levels in the organization and become more senior, it behooves you to define the problem that needs to be solved. And then once you've come up with a solution, you've changed the situation. And then you have to check. And if the situation is still undesirable, you've got a loop. So the problem solving process is not linear. Those of you who understand something about systems engineering will see it's a feedback loop or a causal loop. Now, that's not, this is not my original idea. I sort of found a drawing on the, on the internet that looks like this. And you can see that the top is identify the problem, explore the information, select the best idea, build and test the idea, and evaluate the results. Well, OK, that's easy. Evaluate the results. That's what we call test and evaluation. And then build and test the idea is systems engineering and project management working together. But what happens there, there, and there? Is that systems engineering or not? Well, in the US DOD, DOD 5000 took that front end out of systems engineering, probably because nobody was doing it properly. But that's where all the important parts of getting the right solution takes place. So what I'm going to give you is the, some of the tools that you use in that area, as well as in the other areas. So let's take a look at the non-systems approach in that loop. Examine the undesirable situation, determine the problem, conceptualize a solution, and then perform the transition and ensure the solution doesn't have any undesirability, and we might call that an acceptance test or an operational test. Sounds like traditional systems engineering to me. The systems thinker's approach, in many instances, is different. Examine the undesirable situation, and here we say, don't use list, use causal loops. Understand the situation, determine the problem, conceptualize the solution, perform the transition, 
and sometimes ensure the new situation doesn't have any undesirability. That's an improvement. But a better approach is the systems approach. Examine an undesirable situation from a number of perspectives. I think it was Patrick who talked about that earlier today. You've got to see things from different perspectives. And here you use tools, things like lists, actors, issues, and relationships. You understand the situation, you determine the root cause of the undesirability, and then the problem is to eliminate the root causes. And then you conceptualize a number of situations. Select one, perform the transition, and ensure the new situation doesn't have any undesirability. And you do this in a systemic and systematic manner. See the word problem only shows up once in that entire slide? Not so. Every one of those steps has a problem and a solution. The problem is what needs to be done, the solution is how it does it, and that's what we call the what's and the how's of systems engineering. So, what are the top three tools? Well, the standard answer is, it depends. And let me explain why. As Dave Snowden would say, it, it de depends on the context. In a systemic approach, we have lists and we have something called the perspectives perimeter which I'll get to in the next slide. In the systematic, we have lists, the Kipling questions, and the problem-solving process. If you don't know what the Kipling questions are, I'll tell you in a moment. And then holistic, where you go beyond systems thinking, and I'll explain why, you have some other tools. Lists, active brainstorming, idea storage templates, and the problem formulation template. So, the perspectives perimeter. It's looking at an issue or a problem from different perspectives. You've heard people say, let's make sure we're on the same page or let's make sure we're on the same wavelength. What they're actually doing is making sure they're on the same point on that curve. And so we have multiple views. So the perspective perimeter provides the advantage of multiple views. It minimizes communications error because we know where we're looking for it. It maximizes sharing meaning, makes sure we're all on the same page or wavelength, reduces complexity by providing a framework for sets of, complex, of, lit, of perspectives, and it provides a template for storing information, which is ideal for case studies. Templates for storing information are fantastic tools. If you're used to proposals or different kinds of documents, requirements documents, whatever, if every document complies with the same template, you know exactly which section of the document to go to to find what information you're looking for. You don't have to waste time looking through the entire document. Now, the limits of a single perspective have been known for many years. One example is here, and you can read it so I don't have to speak it. Read quickly, because my finger's going to click. But this has been known a lot longer. There's the parable of the blind man and the elephant. And each of the blind man feels a different part of the elephant. And together, somebody can work out it's actually an elephant and it's not one of those individual things. So the standard set of perspectives I'm going to give you are what I call the holistic thinking perspectives. These are a set of perspectives for viewing a systems. They're organized as external, internal, progressive, remaining, big picture, operational, functional, structural, generic, continuum, temporal, and quantitative. And those are prescriptive ones where you, those are, sorry, observation ones where you get information from what you see. And then you churn those ideas in your head and the scientific perspective is, aha, I think the cause is, I think the problem is. If I go through it, the external perspectives, the big picture, that's uh, the context the, and any assumptions. And so once we understand the context and the assumptions, which is important, we can then go further. Operational perspective, that's what the system does. 
That's a black box perspective. We're not concerned about what goes on inside the system. We just want to see how the system interacts with its environment. Causal loops are a tool that are used there. Internal perspectives, functional, what the system does and how it does it, that's the white box. And those are, again, causal loops. And the structural is how the system is constructed and organized, how data is arranged, and so on. Progressive or generic, where the system is perceived as an instance of a class of similar systems. So you can inherit characteristics and requirements from similar systems. You can look at similar systems and compare your system with it. And a lot of out-of-the-box ideas come from generic perspective. Oh, well, that system over there in somebody else's box is similar to the one I'm using. Let's get an idea from them. Continuum perspective looks at differences. How is this system different? And again, out-of-the-box solutions come there. And so these perspectives are beyond systems thinking. The temporal perspective deals with the past, present, and future. Quantitative perspective, that's the numbers. So do you really need a, a quantum level clock with 10 to the minus 18, or will 10 to the minus 1 do? So you, build, you use the tool, the measurement number, for the particular context. And the scientific perspective, that's the ideas that you come up with. So I'll give you an example, a house. From the big picture perspective, we have the location. Now, if I was marketing real estate, that would have been location, 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 purpose and assumptions. Operational perspective, that's the scenarios of how we use the house in the weekday mornings, afternoons, evenings, as well as the activities. The functions are performed in the scenarios. And then the structural perspective, electrical, plumbing, heating, cooling, generic continuum, and so on. You can read the rest. So we've taken the complexity of the house and we've abstracted out the aspect of it that we need. If we're interested in the plumbing or the electrical system, then we just look at that actual structural perspective and we don't care about anything else. So we, we manage, the way human beings manage complexity, and they've done it for many, many years, is to abstract out things that are not relevant. And it also helps you think differently. Like, there's a debate in management that says a well-trained manager can manage any type of project in any domain. A lot of managers will agree to this, a lot of managers and other people won't. Well, from the continuum perspective, if the functions of management are planning, organizing, directing, and controlling, the statement is valid as long as the project goes according to plan. The moment the plan no longer holds, you need domain knowledge to make decisions, to adapt. And at that point, a manager without domain knowledge cannot manage it. So the, these perspectives help you think differently. The Kipling questions. This is Rudyard Kipling in the uh, Justo stories. What, where, when, how, why, and who? These are questions newspaper reporters use as well. And so I show this active brainstorming matrix. Traditional brainstorming is great. It suffers from a number of defects. And one of them is ideas are not prompted again. But see, you can look at those holistic thinking perspectives, big picture, operational, functional, structural, and so on. And you can ask questions. Here's the question. Who's going to use the system? Who are the customers? Where is the system going to be used? Why is it going to be used? What is it going to achieve? What would happen if we didn't have the system? And all these questions come from the different perspectives. Now, another type of matrix is constraint mapping. Constraint mapping deals, in traditional systems, it deals with weight, power, uh, and so on. And so you can take those constraints, you can 
put in your matrix, and you can ask the same kind of questions. But what do you get a re if you combine them together, you get a real powerful tool because you've got the holistic thinking perspectives down that way, the constraints across, and you can pose the Kipling questions in each area of the matrix. So all of a sudden your brainstorming and your idea generation has so many prompts that you'll get a lot more ideas. So you generate the ideas, okay? Systemic and systematic use of PPs, perspective perimeters. In a systemic approach, you reuse the same applicable perspectives every time, so people know what to expect. They come in ready to do it. In a systematic manner, you use active brainstorming via the Kipling questions according to the problem-solving process, and you store the ideas systemically and systematically. So, next tool is idea storage templates. They contain lists of ideas, and many people are familiar with SWOT, strength, weaknesses, um, opportunities, and threats. I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to talk briefly about three more, OARP, FRET, and SPARK. So when you do the active brainstorming session, first you do brainstorming, then you do active brainstorming, and now you start to sort the ideas. Well, observations, those were all the ideas that you got that don't fit into any other character. Assumptions, assumptions are very important because if you get the assumption wrong, then everything else is wrong too. Risks and what the real problem is. This is sort of your root cause. And I just want to show a, a video about how assumptions influence actions. You see how the truck, truck driver made an assumption? Didn't check it? Poor communication. Communications is kill. Assumptions are really important too. You laugh at it in this context because it's original. It's, um, it's easy to see the result. But you start writing requirements that way, or doing design based on incorrect assumptions, you may not find out for months or even years that the car went over the cliff. FRAT focuses on the solution. Functions, requirements, answers, and tests. This leads into your traditional systems engineering side. SPARK are the activities to resolve the problem. Schedule products, activities, resources, risks. These ideas will, read into, will lead, lead into the systems engineering management plan. And the flow of ideas is um, the initial ideas happen in brainstorming, they're stored, and once the brainstorming ends, you go into the active brainstorming, and those ideas are then stored. They then go into OARP, FRAT, and SPARK. And the idea, the action of moving ideas into OARP, FRAT, and SPARK tends to trigger other ideas as well. So once you've got all this stuff together, the result is complexity. Because you've got loads and loads of information. So what do you do about it? Well, from the continuum perspective, I'm going to organize complexity as objective, subjective, and artificial. And when you're dealing with complexity, let's take a look at the problem. There's well-structured, ill-structured, and very ill-structured problems. So how do you deal with complexity in this issue? 
Well, the first tool is don't care. Remember Mike showed that N squared matrix? I think it was Mike. And that he, uh, design, sorry, was it Mike or Ollie who showed the design structured matrix? You take a look at every item in that design structured matrix and you go through it and you say, is, it a, is this applicable in, in my situation? Is this idea applicable? Is this applicable? If it isn't, keep it. If it is, keep it. But if it isn't, keep it and know why it wasn't usable or if it could be used. However, the advantage are it removes the irrelevant clutter, but it requires subject matter expertise because you've got to know for sure that this is not relevant. But this is the tool people use when they're sorting ideas out after brainstorming. All the literature on brainstorming says after you've got the ideas, then you deal with them and treat them and process them. It doesn't tell you how to do it. Gloss is over that. So in each aspect, you have a problem. So the most useful tool is the problem formulation template. It has five parts. The undesirable situation as perceived by the stakeholders. And what you're going to find is different stakeholders will perceive the situation differently. That's fine, you document it. The assumptions, critically important. The feasible, conceptual, future, desirable situation as perceived by the stakeholders. And one way you can get stakeholders to agree on the future whereas they can't agree on what's undesirable, is asking the question, how will we know that the situation is no longer undesirable? And people, some will say this is not there, others will say this is not there, others will say this is not there. So your problem becomes how to convert the FCFDS into reality. And so you take a list of actions that need to be made, and that list of actions feeds into your compliance matrix, because those actions have to be done in order for the system or whatever the solution is. The solution provides the remedy. It has to be operational with the evolving adjacent systems over the operational life of the solution and the adjacent systems, and it's made of two parts, process and product because some of the ideas, and here you can trade off. You can build a complex system in a short period of time, perhaps, or you can build a simple system in a long period of time. Or you can use different technologies. Some technologies require more expensive processes, others don't. And so you don't get taught this in systems engineering or in project management, but systems thinking shows that there is a trade off across the process and the product domains. And the flow of ideas is pretty easy. OARP, FRAT, and Spark flow into the template in this way. So that's the template. Well, okay, how do you start filling out the template? What do you do? With all the focus on process in systems engineering and in COSI, there is no process for tackling a problem. Have you noticed that gap? So the one I use is this. You start the milestone, you determine the objectives, you determine the resources, and the first thing you do is, who's faced this problem before and what did they do about it? It's similar to TRIS, if you know what that is. Then you start building the compliance matrix because these are the objectives, this is what I have to achieve, and so on. And then when you look at who's faced the problem before, the tool I use there is the copycat. I look around, who's done this before? And now I start using generic and continuum thinking. What was the same, and what's different? So will what worked in that context work in my context? And maybe I need to make some assumptions. Okay, well, I'll list them and so the experts can know better. The first thing you do is create the compliance matrix because that drives the work. So, compliance matrix. It's a list of what needs to be done. 
It's the top tool. And you make a space in the list for what needs to be done, where it needs to be done, or was done. You're familiar with a requirements traceability matrix? It's exactly what it is. So, let me, and the way you complete this is instead of working forwards, you work back from the solution. So, consider I'm standing up here today. You prepare it like this. Make the presentation. Okay, what did I need to do to make the presentation? Well, I need to come here, travel. So I need to arrange travel. I need to arrange accommodation. And then I need to prepare the presentation. Okay? But you prepare it like this, but you list it in a forward way. So you see the traditional plan. And each step has its own problem formulation template to the degree of formality that it's required. And so some of the tools you, you can use are PAM charts, which I explained last year, not this year, Gantt and PERT charts. Now, I put that up there. What's missing? First question you should come back with me is, what's the context? Well, what's missing? Mm. How do I get home? According to this, I'm stuck in Zurich because there are no travel arrangements for returning home. This is the importance of scoping the problem, bounding your problem. And somebody mentioned this morning that there were many, many different definitions of system. And I looked into all that years ago, and I came to the conclusion that everybody's definition of a system was they were bounding their problem. And they were working in different areas of what Derek Hitchens calls his five layers, and it, they're working in different areas of framework where the vertical dimension is Derek Hitchens' five layers, and the horizontal dimension is the stages in the system life cycle. So, you bound your problem and you define it. And then other, you get other people to look at this and test it, and somebody will look at this and test it and say, okay, Joe, how are you gonna get home afterwards? Oops, okay, fix it up before I do it. So in summary, the context I talked about was problem solving. I introduced systems and non-systems approaches, talked about systems thinking briefly, and gave you the top three tools. Well, what are the top three tools? Because there's more than three. Well, it really depends what you're thinking about. The top tool that generally gets used everywhere is a list. But the system thinking people say, don't make lists. Use causal loops. Well, a list is a tool for get collecting information for a purpose. A causal loop is a different tool for gaining an understanding of the relationships. You cannot use a list to gain an understanding. And if you're creating a causal loop, you still have a list because you have to list the items that are in the loop. And so over the last, since I, since I left Singapore, well, by the time I was in Singapore, I was developing these ideas. And since I've left Singapore, I've written them all up in a book. And so the book is coming out on September the 13th. There is 100 plus different tools for project management and systems engineering and other aspects. And I must have been doing something right because I've this book was with CRC Press, and they now have given me contracts to write three more textbooks for next year. So, coming next year will be the systems approach using all these tools. So, I hope I've given you some thoughts and some tools that you can take away and use tomorrow, the next week, and for the future. Thank you for listening.
Thank you, Joe. Um, just to pick up on your comment, um, there were lots of people actually taking um, images of your of your slides. So you're, you're, you are very good on the um, on the uh, photographing um, KPI. Okay. Um, possibly well, higher than Dave. Don't want to set you up against each other. But uh, <laughs> does anyone have a question? No, no one. I'm everybody, not... everybody wants to leave. I think, I think being right before the uh, the closing is, uh, is a factor. But no, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, obviously, Joe's staying. We're all going for an app hour anyway. So I mean, there's plenty of time there for for um, getting uh, extra extra questions there. But thank you again, Joe. Really appreciate it.